To next podcast, blah, 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 episode 20, Sean. Lisa. And there we go. We've done, we got the intro out of the way. Yay. We're, we are ready to do stuff. Yay. And so, we have stuff to do. Holy cow, do we have stuff to do. And it's pretty fitting that this is episode 20 because this is also <laughs> with the help of all things divine and non-divine. This will be out on the 20th of February. That is our target release date. Because. Oh, because. Because it is the 20th anniversary of probably one of the greatest days in Brianista history. And we weren't there for it. No, because <laughs> I had student teaching and there's no way I could have traveled to England and missed that much time. And I didn't think it would happen. Well, yeah, but I didn't either. <laughs> I was extremely cynical, but this was the debut of Smile. Yes. At the Royal Festival Hall in London, England. We've been outside of Royal Festival Yes, we Hall. have. We touched the wall. Yep. I was surprised um, <laughs> at how close it was to our hotel. Yeah. It was a, just a quick walk and just right on the Thames. But I kind of love how I was flipping through a book once in a store of the greatest moments in rock and roll history, and this was one of them. Yeah. And also, wasn't another one of them when uh, Brian's, Brian's breakdown? Yes, because that is what launched basically a new level of artistry for him that's what yeah. led to california girls let him run wild little girl i once knew pet sounds good vibrations etc 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 and arguably 15 big ones in a roundabout way <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh we'll talk no. about that in another day uh yeah many yeah other we'll talk days. about that in in uh, two and a half years for the 50th anniversary of <laughs> no, that set no album. no <laughs> but yeah just to uh, give you a, a little uh insight into uh the lead time we give this episode we always post the date that we record the episode when we release the episode but in case you didn't notice that part in the episode description we are recording this on the 3rd of february just to give us enough time to get this thing working because we think this is going to be pretty intense oh uh, yeah and of course this is coming at a really bad time this is a second episode in a row we had to talk about something really bad uh, just simply because we, we got to acknowledge it uh, as fans. And that's, of course, the uh, uh, very unexpected to us, at least, death of Melinda Wilson. Yeah, on January 31st. Yeah, we know nothing more than any, anybody else listening, except maybe some insiders who might listen to this podcast. I don't know if they do. But yeah, I can only guess at certain things, like how perhaps she might have been sick for a long time. Or at least a short time, given that she died peacefully at home. Yeah, I know I heard little bits and pieces over the pet over more recent years. And I don't know if it came from people who truly know what they're talking about or if it was just the usual fan speculation. But there were there was some little little rumblings that she was not in good health. Nothing hmm. specific. We don't know what was going right. on and that she also really wasn't seen out the way she normally was. So I'm guessing this was not something that just came out of the blue, that yeah. she had been ill for some time. But And I'm wondering, again, just speculating, maybe it might have contributed to Brian's not really quite putting his heart into his performances in 2022 yeah that you know he may have had might concerns. have been one of the many she, things that she may have insisted that. that he still go out on the road but he really his heart wasn't in it i wouldn't be surprised that if could that be were part it too of it. but um brian posted on his social media and i didn't tell you this but because you didn't even tell me i didn't want to tell you until you got my home. first knowledge of this was a post by robbie wrist Hmm. So I found out about this from Cousin Oliver, Wow! but he's, he's a big Brian Wilson fan as well. So yeah. he's involved with all the social media. So yeah, I, I thought that was, that was interesting. Yeah. At first I thought you were the one who told me, cause we had a messenger thing going on, like just logistically things like, Hey, we, Hey, do you need me to pick up anything? Blah, 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 blah. And then I saw Melinda died and I'm like, Oh, shit. and, uh, 
I'm like, that's interesting. I usually hear that from our friend Slice. It, it was. was for, it was from him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, oh, he's the one. Okay. Because he, he usually is the first person to tell me about, well, sadly, tragic news like that and uh, Jeff and Billy Hinchy and all them. But uh, still, I mean, it's this provides us with a tragic um, reason for a segue here because it was arguably, if not not even arguably at all, because of Melinda that we're able well, to talk about. I would not ever use the word tragic. I think this is a tribute to her. True. And just true. kind of showing the level of support that she gave Brian, not just at home, but also in terms of his career, that she really, she was the mess of help he needed to stand alone and that she really helped him get, and again, I'm calm down, calm down people. I'm not saying she was, the savior and and the cause for everything, but she was an instrumental part. She certainly helped. And she definitely helped get Brian with people who were not only talented, but also extremely supportive of him in multiple ways, which is what he needed in order to, to feel comfortable and safe approaching this project that had really caused him a lot of grief way back when. Mm-hmm. So it's like she helped make this happen. Oh, yeah. And for that, we have to say thank you, Melinda. Mm-hmm. And we got to meet her a few times and she was always really nice to oh, us. Definitely. She was nice to me even after one time when she tore me a new ass <laughs> online once. <laughs> So I, yeah. I was rather pleasantly surprised she was nice to me. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I Melinda. Think, yeah, I don't think she held any crutches. But. Yeah. And something I just want to mention that I just saw yesterday that I was really glad to see is that Elizabeth Banks, who portrayed her oh, in Love yeah. and Mercy, posted on her social media a really nice photo of her and Melinda and just some nice thoughts on her and how much she enjoyed working with her on the movie. But it sounds like they also had some level of friendship because she said how Melinda gave her advice on various things. And I was hoping to see that. And I was glad to see that. Yeah. And what really got to me was, uh, from Mike's Twitter account. Oh, oh, that was, that was something. Yeah, He's one of those blue check people on Twitter, which means he can post like up to 5,000 characters. (laughs) If you haven't seen it, just do a search for that. I'm sure it's on other sources besides Twitter, but, uh, It was on behalf of him and uh, Jackie. It was such a nice tribute. and uh, Very well said. Yeah. And of course, there were some jerks who had to say, yeah, after you sued, you're it's like, dude, shut up. Shut up. All right. Yeah, seriously. It's a perfect example of no good deed goes unpunished. Well, it's also, we are talking about family. Yeah. Which is often far more complicated than people outside can ever understand. So it's like, just take things at face value. Yeah. He could have said nothing. Because we don't know. I mean, yeah, he was damned if he did, damned if he didn't. If he didn't post anything, people, well, what's, what about his cousin, Mike? It's like, dude, okay, there there are things you don't know, things we don't know. So let's get into- Focus on the positive. Let's get into now what we are going to talk about. And I will present this since it was 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 my idea. idea. Mm -hmm. So what we are going to do is- go through the 2004 Brian Wilson Presents Smile and compare and contrast with the 1966-67 tracks. And we're going by the way Smile was put together for disc one of the Smile sessions. Right. Where it's they basically take Smile tracks and put it together to as closely match the 2004 version as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like if they had done it this way back then, this is kind of how it would be compiled. Of course, there are some things that are missing, some lyrics, some musical motifs, some things that were put in that were obviously still kind of in the rudimentary stages, so the audio is not as pristine as other parts. But we're taking it as it is. Since uh, we might have gone a slightly different order, I don't know if you went in the exact order as 2004 or if you followed the order of 2011. Why don't you call out the tracks? Well, I did follow the order from 2004. 
And the way I approached it was I went track by track and basically said which one I thought was better or that had the upper hand or if they are both great on their own. And in one instance, you're going to love this. Oh, boy. I don't care for either. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. So I started with our prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, my thoughts are, first of all, I think the 66 version sounds a little bit more cathedral-y, which is kind of what I think they were going for. Well, yeah, it had a little bit more reverb on it. That yeah, kind of gives it, that atmospheric feel. Yeah, I think it was in uh, David Lee's liner notes for 2020 that it makes you feel like you're in a cathedral. And yeah, he's he's absolutely right. You can actually see the high ceilings. And the stained glass exactly, rose window. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like Brian and the guys did a great job of putting that forward back in uh, 1966. For me, I call this even. I really? think okay. both. I think both performances are nearly identical except 2004 does not have that atmospheric feel but when you right. look at just the singing i think they both are pretty close however i will say 66 has the slight edge in that it has what i call the amen hmm. at the end because in 2004 they just end with mm, whereas in the earlier version somebody is going Day. Like there's a little bit tiny difference. I Listen, think the 2004 version has no, that, has that the other one doesn't. Not, not my copy. <laughs> we both had the same copy. I know, we, but no, it, it's just the, mm, they may have done it that way in concert, but not on the recording. <laughs> Listen to it. Trust me. Mm -hmm. I, I've I went over, many, I many, went many over times. this several times for this purpose. So my favorite, though, I prefer the 66 version. I mean, the 2004 version, I think they kind of made it a little bit too dramatic and kind of made it so that they were saying, look, everybody, this is what you've all been waiting for. And well, uh, yeah. kind of overdoing it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I don't like that they stretched it out for so long. Like, I think there's like a 20 second difference between the two because they're, they hold out their final notes in each line for quite a while. Now, I don't know if you remember what it was like to sing this thing when we were at the <laughs> Old Town School Beach Boys Ensemble. It hurts to I sing it. <laughs> I have good lungs and I had to take deep breaths. And I know Kathy didn't have a sing as long as it's on yeah, the you 2004 weren't, You weren't version. on the alto part either, babe. Yeah, I had the easy part too. Uh, yeah. So that and also I have a problem and I've had a problem with it since September 28th, 2004. The very, very, very beginning of the track has a glitch. There is, you can hear like a little crackle at the very beginning. And that's exactly why I'm not upset about Smile not winning the Grammy for Best Engineered okay. Album in 2004. So 2004, 2004 Smile is two minutes, nine seconds, and 1966 is. Keep in mind, minute. that includes G. G and our prayer master are uh, banded together. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it might be about the same because our prayer plus G is 209. And on the smile sessions, if you take our prayer and G together, that's a minute 56. Yeah. So pretty close. Yeah. That's there's a several second different difference yeah, but there. And still, it's not like it's anyway. And the other thing I have with 2004, mind you, I love it. But the reason that I give 66 the edge I don't like that 2004 incorporates 1968 overdubs hmm. because there's that really high note that I think Bruce sings on the 68 version. They included hmm. that in the 2004 hmm. version, kind of killing off the 66-ness of it. Hmm. So I wasn't really a big fan of that happening. It's still great. I still like it. I still enjoy it. But for me, 66 gets it. So, G. Mm-hmm. I think the 66 version is better because it sounds cleaner and the uh ba 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 is a lot Sorry. more prominent in the mix. In 2004 you don't really hear that as much. Yeah, yeah. And I know you don't like this either. The effect that they had on the beginning where it sounds like they're singing in like an old-timey 
Victrola, or if it's Second City, a traffic cone. <laughs> well, I think it was supposed to simulate a transistor radio, which that that yeah. thought I really dig the concept of it because hey, that's the kind of music that uh, like say Brian and Mike would listen to on their transistors. Yeah, but. I don't know. It it doesn't, it feels out of place to me. I like the concept. I just don't like the effect of it. And I especially did not like how they tried to replicate that in concert yeah. after the album came out where like, they were singing their, through their fists. Yeah. Yeah. I When they first, when they did the first couple of legs of the smile tour before the album came out, they just sang it straight out and it was so much better. Yeah. And I agree. I pr- much prefer the 66 version. It has a lot more power to that thing. It sounds like something you could have blaring out of your car stereo in a convertible going through the desert say yeah and if you try that with the 2004 g it's gonna kind of miss the mark yeah and during that little effect they have in their voices that transistor effect or whatever you can actually hear their first inhale before they start singing and it kind of kills off the the vibe i think yeah and now heroes and villains heroes and villains i have a lot to say (laughs) <laughs> oh, we're going to talk about that song too? Uh, yeah, we kind of have to. Oh, okay. Do you want to go first? Okay, sure. Um, I'm going to talk about both versions just to kind of get the ball rolling on heroes and villains. Something that uh, I like about the 2004 version is the way that it was banded in 2004, how the little uh, trombone intro flows perfectly right into the beginning. I don't like how they did it in 2011 where it completely faded out then there's silence and then the song starts. Why couldn't they make it a perfect transition into there? But having said that they banded the track really weird in 2004, because before the singing starts, you still hear. And that drove me nuts when they had the, uh, make the heroes and villains video contest. And every single entrance started with, Um, come on people. You couldn't have trimmed it. (laughs) You couldn't have trimmed a little bit closer. So it starts with Brian singing. Come on with all that. I do prefer the 1967 version, partly because the harpsichord sounds real. There's not a real harpsichord in the 2004 version. That's an electronic keyboard with a harpsichord sound, and it sounds kind of not real. I I definitely prefer the, the real thing. I don't like the you're under arrest in 2004 because Nick sounds a little bit not silly enough. And what I don't understand is that The little feature that's the mini documentary about the making of the album, they show Nick recording that, and he did a whole bunch of different takes, and he says, you're under arrest, and Brian said, that's it, we got it. Hmm. So he did it like that. Why didn't they use that one, the silly one? He sounded just like Gene Gaddy did in the 67 version. Yeah. I mean, I like that it has that kind of goofy feel to it, because there's a, a big thing about Smile that I think Brian had in 66, 67 was humor. Yeah. It definitely ha- was supposed to have a lot of fun to it. Yeah. Well, my vote is definitely firmly for the 66, 67 version. Weirdly, more 67. I have two problems with 2004. One is that you may have said this, which just stuck in my head forever, so it's your fault, hmm. that when we first, first, first heard this Heroes and Villains, I think we were in our hotel room at Beetle Fest. Yes. And it was when radio stations in different countries were leaking smile tracks, authorized leaks, I yeah. should say. And people were catching and it over people were co- People were recording them and putting them out. So even though they weren't great quality, it was still a taste. And I remember you said that Brian sounded like Ozzy Osbourne, and I never could get away from that. <laughs> I could have sworn that you said that. Well, maybe we both said it. I don't know, but and, I thought also, you said it. Something I swear that it sounded like a completely different vocal track when we first heard it. Like what yeah. we hear on the actual CD, whatever is available today, it sounds a lot better than what we heard. It almost sounds like Brian re-recorded his vocal because he didn't like it or something. Yeah, I don't know. But I'm not crazy about how Brian sounds on this. He doesn't sound this way on most of the rest of Smile. Sure, It's just this track in particular, I'm not crazy about his vocal. And also the backing vocals, there's a lot of like a titch sound, you know, chit, 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 chit. And, and I it, don't like when Darian's go, do you? It's like, where'd that come from? Like, I don't know if that's what sibilance is. I try to kind of sibilance figure out, but 
So I don't mean, I mean, maybe it's not sibilance because it's not an S sound, but it just sounds like there's too much of a, that little ch sound hmm. really annoys me. And when you look at 66, 67, first of all, Brian's vocal is much more spirited. Yes. Like he sounds, he sounds like he's having a really great time yes. singing that song. And the piano sounds better. Now, when they did it back then, was this a piano that would have had masking tape? Um, probably not, because okay. if it did, it would have sounded more like the transition in God okay. Only Knows. That's, I mean, I was just wondering if they used, if they altered the piano or if this was a tack piano that they used. I'm suspecting there might have been a tack okay. piano because something sounds, well, there's a harpsichord in it. That's yeah. for sure. Well, I mean, the keyboarding sounds a lot better. And I mean, this is one of my favorite Brian productions ever. I mean, I always loved the single version, but when I heard the In the Cantina version, oh, I was yeah. like Christmas morning that I got one of my favorite Beach Boys songs with even more in it. And hmm. it was just wonderful. Well, I thought we were talking about Heroes Shut up. But I will say both versions do an excellent job on the final part after the ascending scale in 2004 they did a beautiful part of copying that little piece that just transitions from heroes and villains into the next track yeah yeah and by the way I, I might sound very harsh about 2000 i like the 2004 version don't get me wrong i'm just saying in comparison we're to how it was done in 67 which, we're, you know? we're, we're comparing and yeah. contrasting which one does it better yeah next so we have do you like worms slash roll plymouth rock okay so I think 2004 does it a lot better, and I will explain why. Mm -hmm. I felt it had a cleaner sound, and Definitely. I also, and I mean, I'm not talking recording quality. I'm talking just performance-wise. And I put in my notes a kinder production. Interesting. In that, you know, and this is kind of where we begin, at least for me, that there are things in the... 66, 67 smile that are kind of sinister, where we're looking at a young man with a lot of problems. Here's a what I wrote in my notes, word for word. 1966, love the stand-up bass and fret noises. The keyboard and the bicycle rider theme sounds quite disturbing and sinister. <laughs> I mean, it. well, we have also discussed this many times well, over true. the years, that it's like, this is music that as brilliant as it is, you listen to some of these tracks and you're like, that boy ain't right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there are other things where it's like, to me, the the earlier Smile tracks, yeah, have some kind of sinister, creepy disturbingness to it. Where 2004, it's much happier, positive. And again, it's not saying in that respect, it's not saying that one is better than the other because you might want something creepy and disturbing. Well, yeah, the next thing I have in my notes about the disturbing and sinister, I said, which could be a bad thing or good thing. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you want yes, and what you want Smile to be. So it really is, it's not a bad thing at all. And I also put in my notes, this brings in the thought that Brian Wilson presents Smile is not going to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> but I will also say, you know, again, I think the 2004 and also having the lyrics is a plus. Yeah. But the beginning, the way the track begins in 66 is mm. fantastic. It's much more pounding and ringing. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, I, I love that so much. That, that is That really little cool. beginning part. I love that. And yeah, I mean, 2004 did a good job of that, but I think the 66 version had more, more grit to it. Sure. Now, going back to the whole thing about something sinister, I mean, yeah, when you hear that, I don't know if that's a piano that's prepared somehow, like with tax or something, or if it's a harpsichord that's doing that little bicycle rider thing, but you listen just to that, that is not <laughs> the music of somebody who is in a, well undisturbed state of mind that's well, that's like, the music of somebody who's going through something really scary well yeah and i mean in 2004 like that little music box thing i mean 
you're a guy. You never had a music box. Oh, I, I have a mother. I've been around them, believe me. But it's like... Me and every little girl had the little music box, and when you open it up, there's a little little ballerina. There's a little ballerina in front of a mirror. Every little girl had one of those at a certain time. So it's like 2004. It's a nice, pretty music box with like a little colored satin interior and a pretty Mm -hmm. little pink ballerina. Like the 66 version, it's more like. Okay, you know that thing about like the creepy dolls that washed up on the shore someplace? Oh, yeah. Like, yep. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like creepy doll factory. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it definitely does sound more disturbed. And I mean, really, that the 66 version of the music box, like that would have, I mean, if Brian had continued an idea he had of doing music for movies that would have been an awesome little musical motif in a horror film absolutely (laughs) well hey bruce johnson said that it's one of the biggest injustices in the world is that brian is not sitting on a stack of oscars for film scoring yep and uh, having said that going back to i'm going to say the 2011 because that's when this thing was put together it sounds kind of sloppy how it was edited together putting in the vocals from the, the bicycle rider section the uh, with the bass and everything. It's like all of a sudden you have suddenly this big jarring thing with all the vocals and this booming bass coming out of the speakers. When you didn't have that the first go around, when it was just the backing vocals and no booming bass, mm-hmm. booming bass, no booming bass, <laughs> sorry. So that was just kind of like, okay, somebody didn't really listen to this very closely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I also prefer the 2004 version, and partly because it actually makes sense in the context of the story that that first part of Smile is telling. I mean, I can, even without the lyrics, I can see, say, the boat on the water heading west. I can tell that the vocals are kind of an homage to the First Nation peoples. Mm-hmm. With the 66 version, it's like, Brian wasn't well. That's that's the takeaway. <laughs> well, that's from the that. thing. We because we don't have the lyrics in there, we don't have that story. Yeah. And also, I mean, the title doesn't give you any clues. Whereas Do you like worms? Yeah. yeah. And whereas the new title of Roll Plymouth Rock, that does give us a story. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the the phrase Pl- Plymouth Rock was in the original Do You Like Worms, mm-hmm. but still. Well, yeah. But we had no idea why. We had no idea why they were singing rock, rock, roll, Plymouth, rock, roll over. It just sounded like Van Dyke Park's wordplay because we didn't have context. Or the lyrics it, existed. We just didn't have the have, or have it access could to have them. been, Or it also could have been just something that Brian came up with or heard and just decided to have them sing where it really didn't mean anything and it didn't make any sense and it didn't, like, there's more to it. Kind of like... um can't wait too long slash been way too long where it's just kind of repeating the same thing. It was like a little musical phrase, you know, little wordplay that he liked, but didn't go further with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But something that I love about the uh, 66 version that they used in the 2011 lineup right before the bicycle rider part, the second part that actually has the bicycle rider lyrics in it, there's a fuzz bass that was a really cool fuzz bass going on. And this is what I wrote in my notes. Wicked cool. <laughs> how that last note that bam, continues into the faux Hawaiian chant. Yeah. And it's just, it's like, oh, that sounds so cool. I wish they could have done that in 2004. That was, that was just so cool. But yeah, the other thing. Because part of it is the woo 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 thing. I don't like that they copied and pasted that on the 2011 version because mm-hmm. it's in the wrong key. Yeah. But having said that, I have uh, some audio aids here. Mm-hmm. This is what it would have sounded like if they altered it so that it would be in the right key. Nah, yeah, I nah, know. That's ex- that sounds horrible. Yeah, it does. Delete that. <sighs> so, yeah, it's a good thing they didn't try to alter it to match the key properly. So, yeah. Okay, so Barnyard. Oh, yeah. I give this to 2004. Okay. Because first, as I put, 
It has David Leaf doing his best baby goat. He's like, meh. Like, he sounds so cute on it. Hey, and Nelson sounds pretty good well, in the adult well, goat, that's, too. Well, that's why I said Nelson. Nelson's going, meh. Like, in his, <laughs> in his flat Boston-y accent. <laughs> like, that That just cracks me up every time. I think you time. have to have a Boston accent to really nail that, that though. That just cracks me up every time. I love it. <laughs> but... 66 67 to me it sounded a lot muddier yeah and also the animal sound effects that they had are kind of lost in the mix it doesn't hmm. it's not it doesn't come out as clear as 2004 sure well did my voice just crack i don't know I, I, oh man peter bradying myself because, yeah, that's something I noticed about the 66 version, too, is that it sounds kind of sloppy, like the mix is all off. But then I th- I think, I think that that recording actually comes from an acetate. I don't think it comes from, from well, a, a tape. Yeah, I mean, it could all, like, I So it's not going to sound great. I just thought, if we're going to pick between the two, 2004 does it. I had a really hard time with this one, because another problem I had with 1966 was it faded in the Humble Harv demo. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's the same problem I have with uh, the Beatles real love and free as a bird. Cause you can, it's, it is painful how you can suddenly at random times, suddenly hear extra piano from the earlier yeah. demo. Yeah. And that same problem happens here. I wonder if maybe they can Peter Jackson this thing and fix mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Or at the very least edit the piano so that it keeps playing through the whole track. So it's not as jarring. Yeah. But I got to say, I ended up preferring the 66 over 2004. Mm. They're both very similar, but the 66 version packs a lot more punch. I think it's like, doom, da, doom, da. but the uh, 2004 version is like, ding, 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 ding. Hmm. it's very similar, but there, it just sounds like a little less, eh, a little too laid back for my tastes. So now the old master painter and you were my sunshine. Yes. 66 version, 66, 67. Denny. Hmm. Dennis Wilson wins. <laughs> I mean, his his vocal on You Were My Sunshine, I, I just love it. And I also like that what we have on the Smile Sessions tacks on the, the barnyard music yes. that has You Were My Sunshine vocals buried in it. Yep. I, I like that. Yep. Bootleg collectors used to call that barn shine. <laughs> Yeah, I or a I, false barnyard, but there's a, the version with Mike singing "You Are My Sunshine." Yeah, that's barnyard. I mean, the 2004 is very well done. It's just oh yeah, Dennis Wilson's vocal man, and, and of course <laughs> you know my big the big disappointment for me the big lost opportunity with this one in the Smile concerts when they had the visuals up there they had like a picture of Brian in a circle or something or mm-hmm. a sun yeah. They and then at the Dennis. end, it should have been Dennis. Mm. Could you imagine the audience oh, reaction? Man. Holy cow. Oh, oh man. man. I originally thought, you know, I prefer the 2004 version because it's cleaner. And um, a lot of these songs I was listening to, the 2004 version, I kept thinking, this is very NPR. And I mean that in a good way. And it's not because the first time we heard it from start to finish was an NPR <laughs> broadcast a few days before it came out. Yep. But... It just seems so artful, I guess. And um, I don't know what else to say about that. Well, it's that, just but- different. It's like, you know, here you have, like, You Are My Sunshine is such a happy little song. And to change it to You Were and make it, like, kind of. Kind of mournful. Yeah. And it just kind of turns it. And again, that could be. And then the happy sax comes in. It's like, like, what is going on here? (laughs) But I mean, that could also be kind of the Brian humor thing. Like, let's take a super happy song and make it super sad. But in the end, I also went with the uh, 66 version and partly was because of Dennis on there, because there's a variety of vocals. And this was a big problem I had when Brian was first going out in concert for those first few years. My whole thing was, does he have to sing every damn note of every single song? I know. It would have been good. Add some music had five lead vocalists (laughs) on it. Why is Brian the only one singing on that? I know. know? Yeah. I mean, that's why I was kind of glad in 
later years of Brian touring when Al, Blondie, Matt Jardine, Darian Mm -hmm. would take leads because the Beach Boys were never just one lead singer. Let's let's have a little variety. Yeah, let's I like showcase, the variety. Let's showcase other people with great voices. It's still Brian's production. Yeah, and yes, I know this is why we're, we're talking Brian Wilson's smile versus the Beach Boys smile. But thing is, Brian did not conceive of smile to be a solo project. No, no, no. Because maybe he should have. Maybe he should have and did what uh, was it? David Anderley suggested put smile and other like wacky projects on brother and keep beach boy stuff on capital well it's just kind of how i always thought the best way smile could have come out would have been if it was a brian wilson album or even a different band name that had the wrecking crew yeah and members of the beach boys as the vocalists i think that would have definitely been much better received than Mm -hmm. if it had been put out as a Beach Boys record. Yeah. So now we have Cabin Essence. Basic track recorded on my birthday, eight years before I was born. So Cabin Essence, this this one, (laughs) man, I enjoyed studying this one. So this is kind of what I came up with. I feel that both versions are impeccably performed. Absolutely. However, the prize goes to 66 67 really okay because slash 68 well yeah because first of all it is one of carl's best vocals ever it's a great i mean the way he starts out singing light the lamp and fire mellow it just (laughs) it's so comfy and like you just feel like he's gonna hug you by the way did you ever look at the uh, sheet music for it that's in the uh, dominic priori book oh god should i i don't know where it came from it might have been like a session thing that was that they found but it says light the camp (laughs) It's like what yeah and then it says so. evan flow there e-v-a-n what the hell does that mean <laughs> lowercase e-v-a-n Oy. what is that what's yeah evan? I, I no 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 and Did they predict pearl jam and also dennis reciting truck driving man yep you gotta have that so yeah. it's like that that gives the that version the edge because of those vocals now the thing is I was reading in somebody's book. I don't remember if it was, uh, I don't, I don't think it was David Leafs actually. It might've been one of the articles in the Dominic Priori book. It might've been heroes and villains. It, I, one of those earlier books that had the truck driving man lyrics, not quite the same as what Dennis and Nick would sing. There was a little bit more to it. And, uh, the caption below it said unused heroes and villains, your lyrics, hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe they just happened to find those when going through the tapes and other things and said, here, let's throw this on here while Hmm. we're at it. Having said that, yeah, this was a really tough one for me, but considering that we're following the 2011 smile, that's the version that I went with, that I went with listening to people are going to hate me for saying this, including you. I think it sounds like total. It sounds like garbage. It really does. For one thing, it's obviously from 1968 because it has the Carl lead vocal and Dennis's vocal on it. Everything else I think is from 66, including the who ran the iron horse vocals. They basically took an eight track tape and I am absolutely confident. They just took the 2020 version, the stereo version and just folded it down instead of doing a proper mono mix Hmm. for this. And it just does not sound good. I Mm -hmm. even compared waveforms and they're very similar. Of course, mine came from the 1990 2020 CD versus the 2011 mono mix. I don't know if uh, the uh, 2001 2020 CD has it different, but I think all they did was fold it down and maybe compress it a little. Hmm. And you can even hear like Dennis's vocal kind of phasing as a result. Hmm. That's a big reason why I actually chose 2004 as my favorite version. And a big thing that puts 2004 over the edge for me the backing track is phenomenal. It is. It is. Oh my God. All the instruments you can hear separated. And that's a big problem I have with the 66 version, even the 1968 stereo mix, because the backing track is in mono. It is in the center. And there's a lot. The vocals are stereo. And there's a lot going on. And you can't hear everything. Like I know something you always appreciated, like near the end when there's that little like Asian sounding yeah, motif oh, that, is that so awesome. you really have to listen for it, but it's there. 
you you really can hear it much better when it's in concert. But and if you listen little... to just the backing track, which was I know was on one of the bonus CDs that came out around two thousand four, like one of the EPs or something. And it's in, or the vinyl version. I think that's it, what it was. And yeah. it is in the '60s version, but again, you really I can't have, hear it at all. No, I could. I huh. you really have to know what you're looking for. Yeah, I'm wondering if maybe Darian had access to the original multi tracks when he was uh, helping sequence this stuff. But yeah, that is just dynamite. Oh, you mean, oh, you oh. mean when Darian loaded things onto his laptop? Yeah, I, because I he probably that. never had that. I before, love that ever. part of the documentary. But um, no, my, for me, in a perfect world, take the backing track from 2004 and the vocals mm. from 66 and 68. Yeah, oh my be nice. goodness. Because here's the thing about that. Like you said, Carl sang it beautifully. It is a fantastic vocal. And of course you had Dennis in there. So you had that beach boy brother dynamic going on. Brian, however, in his later years did not have a soft voice. No, that he could sing. no, he did not. He's very harsh. Number one, number two, he's double tracked on this. So you light the lamp and fire. It's like a little I mean, bit too harsh. Well, the thing is, to light the lamp and fire. on Brian's best day, he could never sing with the softness that Carl had, which probably right. is why Carl yeah. sings God Only Knows and not Brian back in the day. So I think there's a quality that Carl had, which is why Carl sang Cabin Essence. And one of those things that... If only it could have happened this way. Could you imagine February 20th, 2004 at the oh, Royal man. Festival Hall? They're playing Smile. If Carl was still alive, he walks out unannounced to yes. sing Cabin Essence. The roof would have fallen in. Mm. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine? Good Lord. <laughs> I wonder if it would have sounded better if Jeff had sang lead on that. Well, again, that's the kind of thing where it's like, Maybe there are things where Brian should have let other people step forward, Sure, but I don't the know. The other issue I have, and this is extremely nitpicky, the way that Nick sings the truck driving man line, because here is how he sings it. Here's that line. Trust as you must, catch as catch can. Just the where, very line. Where Dennis did catch as catch can. Yeah, here's what it would have sounded like if Nick sang it the right way. Trust as you must, catch as catch can. <laughs> I love digital audio technology. But yeah, that little rise up that Dennis did yeah. makes a difference. It really does. <laughs> it, yeah, because I, I don't want to make this sound too bad or anything, but the way Nick did it, it almost sounds a little bit lazy. It's like, yeah, it's just the same note, so we're just going to keep it at the same note. Well, also keep in mind, it may have been a choice. and Could have not, been. not like you have to do it exactly the way Dennis right. did it. That. That was his interpretation, or that may have been, maybe Brian didn't like the way Dennis sang it, and he wanted Nick to do, so Could you have be. to consider yeah. that, too. Yeah. And, yeah, and by the way, that, what you just heard, what we all just heard there, Nick by himself, that was not from any archive or anything. That's from the actual released Smile CD. It's just proof that instead of performing the chorus twice, they actually literally copied and pasted it, and then Nick sang over the pasted version. Well... All you got to do is put those two on top of each other, invert the phase on one of them, and bam, you got Nick by himself. So that that's really cool, I think. But yeah, yeah for if me- only, If only Brian had had digital editing and digital producing back in the day. That could have been a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. That, oh my goodness. He would have been, he would have still been in the control room at Western with a really long beard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm not saying that anybody on on the inside who might have access to the original multi tracks should send me a stereo copy of the Beach Boys vocals by themselves that I might synchronize with the backing track of 2004. You're not saying that at I'm all. not saying they should no. email us at uh, tunex at fab4it.com yeah. or anything. But. So now we are at the second movement. Yes, my favorite movement. Spoiler alert. We start with wonderful, hmm. and I give the edge to 2004. When I listen to the two different versions, Brian is not Ozzy Osbourne here. He sings this very sweetly. I think as sweetly as he did in 66. The yo the little yodelay he hoos are much more prominent here. Personally, this version just will always stick with me because when I first heard it, it was, again, one of those radio recordings because we didn't have the CD yet. I was doing my student teaching and I did my student teaching with seventh grade. 
And there was a girl who carried herself in a very regal way. Hmm. Like, I don't know if she may, I mean, my guess is maybe she had been studying dance because she walked with very good posture, her head held held high. And there was one day, I forget the reason why, but she was wearing a little crown. It was for (laughs) some kind of spirit week or something like that. And it just looked perfect on her. I might even have a picture of that. And it's just the song made me think of wonderful It's like a girl who's fallen off the path, who's had troubles, but yet still carries on with her head held high. I'm not saying this girl had troubles or anything, but it just, that kind of would be like the girl who would play that part if you were to film this somehow. Mm -hmm. And it just made me think of her in a positive way, a girl who's going to carry on no matter what happens with a boy or whatever life throws at her. So it just, that version just kind of sticks with me for Mm -hmm. that reason. But I feel like it was a beautifully done production and a little bit better than the 60s version. Yeah, you and I actually differ on the Yoda Lady Who thing, (laughs) because I think that's just too much. I think my favorite version of any of them is the one that's on disc two of the Good Vibration set, because it doesn't have that. It's just Brian and some extra harmonies at the end. But anyway, going back to the topic of the one they used in 2011 versus the one that Brian recorded in 2004, this was another one that I had a really hard time with for a while, but I actually prefer the 66 version simply because on the 2004 version, Brian is straining to reach some of the higher Mm. notes, and it kind of to me kind of diminishes it a little Hmm. it's still a great performance i think and really i would listen to this thing over and over and over as part of that second movement because like i think that all the performances on it just work perfectly together including this this is a great start to it so for me 2004 smile then we have look slash song for children oh do we ever and i give 2004 the edge here (laughs) because i was trying not to fault the early tracks for not having lyrics, but when you realize how much the lyrics enhance and tell the story, like the music, the music is fantastic, but it doesn't tell the story. I, I, again, I remember listening to one of those radio, it came from like, like Sweden or something, (laughs) because there was an intro in, in some other language that we don't understand. Like you could tell how it, just flows from the end of wonderful. And then you have the one, 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 maybe not one, that kind of word play between one, the word wonderful and the word one, and then bringing in the muted trumpeter swan from Mm -hmm. surfs up. I have goosebumps just talking about this because it's so awesomely beautiful. And then it has the look music. And one thing though, I wish is that they cut out the 12th Street rag part, the da 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 I wish they could have found a way to put that, maybe not here, but somewhere else. I just wish they could, because I do love that little that little riff, but it really would not have, it was too whimsical for this track. Yeah. And this movement. Sure. But- It's just absolutely amazing. And it's providing the transition between from starting from wonderful, going all the way down to surfs up. Sure. I remember when we first listened to the February 20th, 2004 recording that got distributed online a few days after the concert. And I heard what we now know as song for children coming. And I swear, I thought, are they just playing the original recording from 66? Cause it was so dead on. It was so perfect. And I remember thinking, wait, there's something missing from here. And it was the do 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 part. Yeah. And I remember reading in a book that Brian took that part out because of copyright considerations. But the thing is, number one, When this was originally recorded in 66, somebody pointed out to Brian that that came from 12th Street Rag. He said, yeah, I know. I will pay for the licensing to use it because I really want to use it here. I'm not going to rip anybody off. But the thing is, in 2004, the copyright would have already expired at that point. And I remember one of the, I don't remember if it was over email or one of the times we got to 
chat with people after the show, I asked Proben about that. I said, Hey, that was always a favorite part of mine. He said, if I remember correctly, Brian made the artistic decision to cut that. Well, yeah. And I have to agree with that decision. If I that's mean, the case. like I said, he may, he may have just felt it was too whimsical because that movement, I mean, when you're leading into surfs up, there's yeah. a lot of seriousness there. Mm-hmm. Like this is not a piece that has Brian's humor in it. It would have been a little too silly. Yeah, to me, silly or not, I think it kind of breaks the flow given the context that we have now as opposed to what they had then. Yeah. When I first heard this and everybody was making their own custom smile lineups before 2004, and let's face it, people are still doing it to this day. I actually considered using this as an overture because I thought this might have been a dumping ground for Brian's ideas, kind of like how perhaps like trombone, trombone Dixie. Dixie. Yeah. Because I'm thinking, okay, there's good vibrations. Do, 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 do. So there's, yeah. he's got that going on. It's got the child is father of the man tru- is, is the in there. Trumpeter swan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm thinking this is an overture. Could be. But, and then when we heard the, uh, the audience recording from the debut night, I heard wonderful going straight into this. And I'm like, holy sh- this is exactly where it belongs. Yep. How I never heard it that way before. It was so obvious. And I think the vocals help kind of seal that connection. Yeah. And speaking of which, the vocals definitely work. But having said that, the 66 version, the way they edited it for two, you have no idea how hard it is to say edited it. <laughs> edited. The way they put that together for the 2011 lineup. They threw in some child is father of the man vocals randomly here and there. Yeah. Just to, it sounded like a desperation. Yeah. Really. Like, okay, we got to make this as close as we can to complete. So let's chop this up, put it over here. Didn't work. It was just so haphazardly shoehorned. So yeah, I, in fact, my notes here says 2004 by a mile. Oh yeah. Now child is the father of the man that I also give to 2004. Hmm. So on the smile sessions, There's a bunch of pieces that are all associated with what we now know as Child's the Father of the Man. And they all sound amazing. Oh, yeah. But they're pieces Mm -hmm. that the 2004 takes it all and pulls it together in a cohesive piece. We also have vocals, including the thesis statement of Smile. Oh. I believe. (laughs) I mean... When I first heard that phrase, I believe, like layered over itself. Oh my God. I just about fell over. Yep. Yeah. And the, what's the next line? Out of the wild into what you can conceive, you'll achieve. <sighs> it's like Brian is telling himself that it's okay and this is not yep. inappropriate music. Oh, but man. This is a thing. So in the 2004 version, we have what we always called like that Carl is present there because you hear man it's such a Carl vocal now isn't it interesting that on the version that actually has Carl you don't really hear that (laughs) as I mean I think he's still singing that but you don't really hear it as much so it's like 2004 is more Carl than Carl (laughs) yeah I, I pretty much agree with you wholeheartedly on everything you said and because 1966, the ver- what they did for 2011 was basically throw a bunch of pieces together without any real. It's well, they just flow. kind of were like, okay, here's the stuff that this track consisted of, but it's just in pieces. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not really listenable on its own no. or or really together. It's more like it sounds it sounds too. Sessiony. But again, those pieces are still amazing. Oh, of course, of course, and uh, I noticed that in the main part with the full vocals and everything. The vocals are a little bit out of sync, and I think I know why, because back during the bootleg days of the 90s, there were two different Child is Father of the Man mixes with different vocals in different yeah. places, and people would actually create fuller versions by smashing them together and synchronizing them, and it sounds very similar to the end of the 1971 Surf's Up, and I think yeah. that's exactly what they did here in 2011, was they took different mixes and layered them on top of each other to get a little bit more of a full sound, and sometimes it falls a little bit out of sync. And also, I really hate how the 2011 lineup, That Child is Father of the Man, comes to a sudden stop. Yeah, yeah, because we don't have in 2004 where it's that beautiful, very serious transition that goes into Surf's Up. So yeah, 2004 for me, by a landslide, much better build up, better flow. 
So now surf's up. Okay. I I can't choose. I can't choose because they are both gorgeous. They both have their own merits. And the way this is what I wrote down, it's Brian's song and he sings it with all of his heart and soul in both versions. I I can't, I can't, I mean that I thought, oh yeah, 66 all the way because that's just his brilliant piece back then that got the attention of people outside the rock and roll community, you know, like Leonard Bernstein and David Oppenheim and showcasing it on Inside Pop and and doing something. I mean, you think about people watching this back then who only knew Brian in a particular way. And here he is in a brown shirt sitting at a grand piano and singing this piece. And it's like... I just thought that would be the winner. But then when I really listened to 2004, I'm like, oh my God, he is, he's still putting the same oomph into it then. It's just, I'm like, yeah, this wins too. This was so hard for me. Very difficult for me. And thing is, as crabby as it sounds, I had to compare the negatives to come to my ultimate decision. Because to me, To me, my favorite version of Surf's Up would be using the backing track from January 67 as it appears on disc five of Good Vibrations, use that as an intro. And then the rest of the song is Brian's demo that was recorded and filmed in December of 66 in the studio with a double track vocal. And then at the very end, have all the guys come in with the harmonies. Mm. But having said that, what I had to do is compare what they presented us on the smile sessions with what Brian did in 2004 and what happened for 2011 was similar to what they did with cabin essence was they took now not, not an eight track session, but a 16 track hmm. thing. Cause it had, it was all from surfs up and smashed it into mono. And again, I'm, I'm thinking that it's a fold down instead of a proper standalone mix for the best sound and having what's supposed to be a 1966, 1967 album with a 1971 Carl vocal is kind of jarring. It's way out of place. They did one of the, uh, yet another one of those synchronizations of Brian's demo with the backing track from the studio. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you hear 1971 Carl canvas the town and brush the backdrop. Oh, come on. No, they should have just left it blank. I thought for a second they could have flown in Brian's vocal from 67, but probably not because he was singing and playing live. So the piano, the out of tune piano would have leaked through. Yeah. So that, and also the Jack Riley lyrics that were used at the end. And you're trying to tell me this is what would have come out in 67. No, no. Even though those same lyrics were used in 2004, I'm still giving the edge to 2004 because it just sounds a lot more put together. Not a big fan of Brian's vocal on there simply because I'm a little bit prejudiced to his 66 performance and hearing Brian's 66 voice versus his double tracked 2004 voice, especially the way the diamond necklace plays the punt, the way he sang the word Hmm. pawn is kind of like how sometimes he would do in concert. Like he just sings something and then cut it off right away. Yeah. Like he said, pawn, he's like, (laughs) punt. So it's like, dude, come on. But I love how they handled the word domino in 2004 to make up for Brian's voice, not being able to go all the way to that high F where they had the multi-part yeah, harmony. Yeah. One thing I do miss though, is the horn in the second verse from 67, where the horns are just kind of going all over the oh, place. Yeah, the it's like, and that's another thing that I loved about wonderful. When the uh, French horn comes in, it's kind of dirty and it's like, <laughs> but it's, but on the 2004 yeah. version, it's smooth. I like the messy horns. I really do. But still, for me, 2004 gets it, like, wins over these two different versions. Okay. So now we are at movement three. Mm. So we have, I'm in great shape, slash, I want to be around, slash, workshop. Mm -hmm. I don't care for either. (laughs) And let me me tell you what I wrote down. Mm. Both are nice little pieces, but they don't work together. And they don't really make sense in the narrative. Sure, I could come up with ways for them to fit, but why should I have to do the work? Movement three could have easily started with the next track. Hmm. 
So I, it just it just feels like they had like these are things that we know were supposed to be part of Smile, so we have to put them in there somehow. And it just it doesn't really make any sense to I me. I kind of understand that. I'm not disagreeing with you. In in fact, well, part of me is thinking there must be a purpose for these tracks to be in there somehow, or else it wouldn't have been used. Also, if they were going to say, well, that's part of Smile, so we got to use it, then where's he give speeches? Yeah, right. And I'm in great shape, I think, because uh, remember in 2011, 2011 went a little tiny bit different from the 2004 lineup because Brian came in and said, no, I'm going to put I'm in great shape a little bit earlier. He put it on the first movement, which is where I think it actually belongs, especially because I think it's actually a heroes and villains segment. So it works much better in that context, I think. But the thing is, we still, still the task that I feel I was presented with was to determine which do you prefer, regardless of whether it fits. I'm going to say the 2004 version of I'm in great shape is I, I prefer it over the, what they used in 2011. I actually like how it sounds in 2000, in the, the 66 version, the, the way they kind of mixed it in. It's one of the better combinations of demo slash actual session tape i think the mix is much better than say what they did for barnyard and uh do you like worms even though the piano from the humble harv demo is a little bit overpowering i think they did a much better job of it but i give the 2004 version the edge simply because of the feed the, that little uh reverb feedback at the end how it comes like really crashing in the 66 one that they used, they used, there were about, I think, five different takes, each with a different level of feedback. They used one that had hardly any at all. So it takes that crashing excitement away from it. And I didn't like that. So 2004 gets it for me there. For I want to be around in workshop. My notes say 2004, nothing not to love about this one, but I still preferred 66 simply because there is something about the 2004 version that I miss. It's the vocalizations. You listen to the 66 version of uh, the workshop part. You can hear people chattering in the background. And I especially love how at the very end, you hear someone say, ow, I miss that when I listen to the 2004 version. <laughs> now with what I think this should have started with vegetables. Mm -hmm. That I, would have been a great start, by the way. Well, yeah, especially really the dun, 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 dun. I give the edge to 66. Both versions are a lot of fun. Well, 67, actually. Well, 67, yeah. Both versions are a lot of fun. And I put in parentheses, Swedish frog. Because <laughs> <laughs> you hear the Swedish frog on both. But the earlier version is just a lot more goofy. And I also like, at the end, that nice little instrumental moment at the end. But both versions are great. Oh, I yeah. Just, I just... I think 66 has a lot more spirit to it. Yeah. I love both versions very much. I, I love the 2004 version, although there's something I don't like about it, that there's some kind of hum at the very beginning, which I think is kind of an overflow from the workshop part. But here's what I wrote in my notes, word for word. The 2004 version is really good, solid from start to finish, but the Beach Boys version just has the edge. Al singing lead through most of the song and Brian taking a turn at the end adds more group dynamic, while Brian singing the whole damn thing in 2004 just makes it seem kind of pigeonholed in comparison. Hmm. I don't mean to be harsh with that. Again, I love both versions. Yeah. I really, well, again, really do. again, it's like, which one has the edge? Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I do not believe Paul McCartney was actually chomping vegetables <laughs> in April 67. I believe he was there for the session. I have no problem believing that, but the session tapes are out there. If he were on it, they would have made a huge honking deal about saying Paul McCartney was on this right here. You can hear him in the background between takes. Well, you would also think, too, you would have heard him speak. Yeah. Paul is not a silent person. No, he is so not. So if, if the tape was rolling between takes, you think you would have heard him. And his voice is quite distinctive. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So holiday slash on a holiday. Mm -hmm. 2004. <laughs> because you need the lyrics. Hmm. You need the narrative, especially the part about the pirate, which we've wondered if that's a little tip of the cap to the fans who listen to the bootlegs all these years. Mm -hmm. 
without making it obvious by talking about bootleggers. Yeah. <laughs> and it has Nikki Wonder doing the little, oh, the little interlude. And I mean, you know, it just reminds me of him in concert waving the little skull and crossbones flag. And I mean, it's just a wonderful, wonderful narrative. And it's like, in the smile world, even pirates are friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a hard time coming up with a, which one I preferred on this one. There was no way I was going to give it a tie because I'm like, okay, there's something about one of these that I prefer about the other, but what is it? And yeah, I do think that the lyrics help, but of course I was trying not to think about that because I just wanted to go with what was presented to us what from what was available. But again, the 2011 mixing, I think is really what kind of pushed me toward choosing 2004 because the whispering winds vocals, they sound a little bit unnatural. I think, well, they were definitely digitally tampered with in terms of tempo to get them to fit the rhythm, yeah. which of course I don't blame them for doing that, but it sounds very unnatural. 2004 isn't perfect either because I think during Nick's little uh, spoken part, his voice kind of gives out at the end. He's like, party. <laughs> but overall, I think the 2004 version, I think it's much more listenable. Yes. And wind chimes. This track, I call it even. It oh. depends on what you want. Do you want something that's pleasant and fun and cool and hip? Go with 2004. If you want something creepy and sinister and kind of off kilter, go with 1966, 67. I can hear you there. Definitely. I mean, cause the 66 version, there's something a bit off about it. And I'm talking that it is intentionally off. It's not more, it's not like something was off and Brian just let it go. He wanted it. Well, off. yeah, he wanted it to sound a little off. <laughs> yeah, it sounds disturbing, but in a good way. And uh, if you listen to the harmonies, some of the harmonies are off. They're, they're a little bit sharp, mm -hmm. a little bit sharp. Yep. And I got to say that what they presented to us in 2011, the edit that they put together is better than most, if not all, fan mixes that I've heard. Mm -hmm. They did a really good job with that. So, yeah, I really like what they did with the uh, 66 version. Having said that, I also love the uh, 2004 version. Because it sounds great. And once again, this is another one of these tracks that I say, this sounds like it would sound really good on an NPR station. Mm -hmm. And I mean that in a good way, of course. But there's something, this is probably the one that I had the hardest time deciding on which one I, I like better. And the 66 version just barely, hmm. barely wins for me. Because sometimes I miss those sinister off <laughs> harmonies. And I mean, granted, the 2004 wind chimes, that has a tiny bit of sinisterness too, a as well, bit, because yeah. it's like an undercurrent. The dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 Which eventually dun, dun. became part of Can't Wait Too Long. Yeah, of I mean, it's a little ominous. Mm -hmm. Like something's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't you listen to this when you're land? Which okay, which version do you listen to when you're landing in Newark? Two thousand four. Okay, I, I don't. I really don't know why this might just be my synesthesia or something, but that track just it somehow fits in with the impending doom of having to land at Newark Airport. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I always listen to it. <laughs> so are we ready to go on to the next little song? Oh boy. The next ditty so, we have to talk about? Fire slash Mrs. O'Leary's <laughs> cow. And this, I also say even. Really? Okay. Yes. Because, okay, the 66 version, and I say 66 because we know it was, it was recorded November in November. It's a brilliant piece of music that came from a very troubled young man. Oh my God. Did I mean, it, ever. it is absolutely, it is brilliant. I mean, especially coming from somebody who was not formally trained, mm -hmm. but yet it incorporates orchestral elements and it tells a story simply through music. Yes, I know there is vocal, but the vocals are wordless. Let's face it, the vocals are another instrument. Hmm. The vocals are not telling a spoken word story. They're just wordless sounds that complement the instruments. So it's frightening. It's furious. 
And it's stunning. Like when you hear it for the first time, you're like, oh, where did this come from? When I heard it for the first time, it was August 1993 on the Dave Procopi tape set back when it was only two tapes. And it scared the shit out of me. Hey, I first heard it. I first heard it probably about a decade earlier on uh, Beach Boys American Band (laughs) before I even knew that it wasn't anything that had ever been officially released. I I don't think because I don't. I don't remember when I read the Byron Price book, if I knew that Smile had never been finished and that track had never been officially released. But yeah, I heard it as part of that and it was like, man. Mm -hmm. And the 2004 version, it's not as scary. It's more hip and cool. I can dig that. It's also that version won Brian a Grammy. Yep. I mean, it's just, yes, we can discount the Grammys all we want, but the fact is, this is Brian getting an award from his community, the music community. They gave him that award. Yep. And it's just like, wow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we know this was something that really meant something to Brian. It was very important to him and just an amazing piece of his story that the music that he thought was inappropriate, that he was kind of scared of, that he claimed for years that he had destroyed the tapes, where mm-hmm. we know he didn't. <laughs> but for years, he said, like, the tapes are gone, because he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want anybody else putting it out. And for it to come around and be so accepted, where he was honored with an award from the music industry, that's huge. And of course, I also, I never really thought about this until I did this study that both versions have something that we really don't hear much in a Brian production, cymbal crashes. Mm -hmm. Brian did not like cymbal crashes. He very rarely used them. Apparently a lot of producers don't. But he probably felt that he needed that effect. Yeah. That he needed to have that in Mrs. O'Leary's cow. And of course, it's ideal. It works. That realization kind of got me that it was essential for obvious reasons. Yeah. For me, the 2004 version easily won out. Hmm. And uh, I'll I tell did you not what. expect you to say that. Well, here's the thing. Again, when we were planning this, I'm pretty sure I was told, go by what's on disc one of, so I literally went by that, the exact version that that had on it. And I think what the folks at Capitol or whoever put this together did might have hurt the track a little bit. And I'm specifically talking about the fall breaks and back to winter vocals that they flew in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't work. Somebody actually singing that part, it works, but not that performance of it because it's so mellow. Going against this furious, furious instrumental track. However, the 2004 version, the vocals are performed in a way that is perfectly fitting for what's going on behind them. Well, also to the the Smile Sessions version, you have the Heroes and Villains intro as we knew it from the uh, Good Vibrations set. I really don't like the way it ends. It's a little too minimal. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's not much to it where in 2004, they had a much fuller sound to it. Hmm. And then you have what I think really helps. You have a great drum moment, you know, da, 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 and then cymbal crash. And then you go into dun, da, dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 where what's on the smile sessions, you don't have that drum moment. So you just have like, the intro that kind of ends a little weak and then it just goes dun, 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 dun. like mm-hmm. it doesn't it doesn't have that crash that it, i think I really is necessary to have the crash but i don't would know that maybe have they been, couldn't have, would that have been possible i don't know well if they didn't have i think they tried to stick as much to the tapes as they could they may not have had anything like that that hmm. they could have put in hmm. that was probably oh don't challenge me that was probably a 2004 creation could have been could have been yeah and uh, something that surprised me though about what they decided to do with that 2011 lineup was they did not use a take of fire that had the fire crackling yeah. effects on yeah. it 
that's written about in all the texts. Like the, I think the uh, Jewel Siegel article yeah. and all mm-hmm. the all the texts well, we was, have in our bookshelf. I mean, even Brian himself in the uh, 1976 special when he's talking about recording fire, and he says, you know, we had we had wood burning in a bucket. I was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, he even mentioned that. Yeah. So it's interesting they chose not to use that. And but the thing is, when you think about it. It's not necessary. No. It's not necessary because the, the music the, the tells music, the story. Oh, yeah, it does. To me, the crackling fire effects would be the equivalent of the British, the original British Sgt. Pepper's album, where after the chord, they throw something else on. Yeah. They throw in the dog whistle yeah, effect. Yeah, you don't need it. And then after that, they have the inner groove loop. It can stand alone. And that's another reason I don't like the 66 version that they used here, because it kept going. Like It's like, da-da, ba-da, ba-da. Okay, it's over. Wait, no, it's not. Ba, da, 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 da. Yeah. Ba, da. Okay, it's over. Little... Da, 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 da. Oh, come on. Just end the damn track well, already. <laughs> well, also, too, it was the, in the 60s version, I mean, you have kind of cobbled together what we know as Heroes and Villains intro. Yeah. Now, even though that piece of music makes obvious sense with fire, the fact that it was labeled Heroes and Villains intro on the tape box Makes you wonder, like, was that a piece that was that kind of one of Ryan's brain dump pet sound sort of things where he just put something down on tape, but he didn't really know what to do with it yet. Well, also, so, if you read the uh, all the texts, they all mention how the way Brian recorded it during those sessions was that a piece of music might be part of cabin essence once, but then Brian might change his mind and say, exactly, actually, no, we're going to exactly. do this. So that might be why this thing that ended up eventually becoming part yeah. of the canon was labeled heroes and villains. And in fact, Mark Lynette himself said that's why it was called heroes and villains intro on disc to a good vibrations. Cause that is exactly what was written on the tape yeah. box where at the moment, It may have been something Brian was thinking of having as part of Heroes and Villains because it's very musical theater, you can say. so, And it it could very well have followed, you're under arrest. Yeah. So there could have been a bunch of like a Keystone Cops kind of thing with whistles and stuff going uh, to represent fire trucks and cop cars and something. But we don't have definitive proof that that actually would have been the beginning of fire. They just made it so for 2004 because it seemed to make the most musical sense. Yeah. And then they put in that nice drum moment, which they didn't have originally. I mean, the original fire track is only what, like, I mean, if you take away that intro thing, it's only what, like a minute and a half. And there are only two chords. Yeah. Yeah. So there may have been more to it that Brian just never even got to or yeah. never even got to the point of thinking about what else am I going to do with this piece mm-hmm. of music. And both versions, I think, should stand on their own because they are both very, very important. They're very important and they're both very similar, yet they're both unique. Yeah. They're both, they're, they're both different. They're enough. both essential to the story of oh, Smile. Yeah. yeah. And the legend, of course. Yeah. Thank God Brian wasn't oh, here. Man. <laughs> like, maybe this is inappropriate music. Maybe God doesn't want us to play this. <laughs> oh, yeah. But then we have Love to Say Dada slash In Blue Hawaii. All right. I just have to say something because say when, when I was preparing my notes for this, I, I did a little bit of lookups and stuff. Something that I don't know if this is common lore that I just somehow missed in all of the texts and the the notes in the smile sessions box and everything, but something that totally went over my head in the 30 years that I've been familiar with love to say da da that I never noticed. Is it just me or or did you oh, also not know? I never ever 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 put that together. See what we just did here was perfect for an audio podcast. I just held up a piece of paper to Lisa that says love to say da da with three letters in red, the first letter of love, the first letter of say, and the first letter of da. <laughs> L-S-D. Ah, uh, yeah. Of well, all places, I read that in the Wikipedia entry. Well, I mean, the dreaded Lysergic definitely had a role in the creation of Smile. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, here we got to have 2004 because... Hmm. I mean, again, the Love Today Say Dada music is 
lovely. It's oh, very, yeah. again, it's very evocative. It makes you like, I see water running down yeah. rocks yes. and sunlight glinting off of it and moss covered rocks along the, the sides of the little stream and on a waterfall and ferns and all. I mean, I see all kinds of stuff, but you got to have the lyrics because yeah, you first really of do. all, you have in the 2004 version, after all the cacophony of Mrs. O'Leary's cow, then things are still and you have the water chant. Water, 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 water. Yeah. And then Brian just singing, is it hot as hell in here or is it me? It really is a mystery. If I die before I wake, I pray the, so- the Lord my soul to take my misery. I could really use a drop to drink somewhere in a placid pool and sink. Feel like I was really in the... Uh, pink. Yes. <laughs> which, which at the time we were... Did he say pink when everybody was listening to the boot, like Mm -hmm. the audience recording? Really not a boot, but. Well, it's technically a boot. It's unreleased. But it's like, everybody's like, did he say pink? But yeah, that is what he said. I mean, just that little transition. It's like where Brian's kind of like he's lost and he's trying to find the right, like the way out of it. Mm -hmm. But then it goes into just this wonderful piece And something that I really don't hear on the 60s track that is very clear on In Blue Hawaii is the little good vibrations rhythm. Mm, So it's kind of like that whole piece is like a, it's a transition into good vibrations. And then the music after the line Aloha Nui means goodbye, where it sounds a little, a little wistful, but then it also sounds triumphant mm-hmm. you know the da, 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 yeah, it brings back dun, the wind dun, chimes dun, thing dun, yeah. dun, dun, dun. and then that little reprise of our prayer mm-hmm. where it's just like everyone is just everyone stop for a moment everyone stop and just listen to this <laughs> refresh my memory did they use that on the 2011 lineup the little our prayer snip yes okay they did yeah i didn't um, remember right now again you got to have the lyrics. The music yeah. is pretty on the 60s version, but the lyrics fill it out so much better mm-hmm. and give you, again, a narrative. Yeah, this is such a hard track to discuss for me because this is another one that I had a really tough time with because I was immediately thinking, oh, 2004 easily wins over this. But the reason was for the same reason you say, because the lyrics are there. It's complete. It adds to the narrative or it has the narrative period. But at the same time, I was thinking, but I I can't prejudice myself like that. I have to go with what exists. But the thing is, love to say Dada, the final track, what is officially recognized as the final track recorded for Smile. There's an asterisk on that, of course. It sounds so incomplete and it just kind of abruptly ends. It sounds like there are missing parts somewhere. Yeah, like it's again, it sounds like something Brian laid down. And when there's only one little background vocal just going wah wah hoo wah. Yeah. That's not that's you it can't was, listen to and that. And they and the fact that they took that and built that into a whole tribute to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and also that Brian was trying to do something with this for a while because it started out as a heroes and villains segment called all day. Mm -hmm. And of course it eventually became what we now know as cool, cool water, but the smile version, the 67 version from May night recorded between May 16th and 18th, I think 1967. And by the way, don't think that I don't believe that Brian might have gotten the LSD idea from somebody he knows who had just finished recording an album called Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club (laughs) Band. There is reason to believe Brian might have been told that there's a song called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, or he might have heard an acetate of it Hmm. or something. Hmm. We know he allegedly he heard She's Leaving Home demoed to him. Yeah. And of course, we know he heard Strawberry Fields Forever, which is already out as a single, I believe. But so. Well, yeah, because that came out in the. A the very end earlier. of 66. Well, the very, well, it, was very, record, very, it was very beginning of 67. Okay, that's it was right, recorded that's at right. the end of 66. That's right. That's right. Anywho, uh, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, 2004 wins. And then, for me. And then now we have good vibrations. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. So 
I call it for the purpose <laughs> of smile, not overall. Sure. But for the purpose of smile, 2004. Reason number one, it's in stereo. Oh. <laughs> we finally got a true, honest to God, stereo good vibration. We had that 1970 with the release of Beach Boys Live in London, though. No, no, no. That's that's a concert <laughs> version. I'm talking a studio oh, version boy. produced by Brian Wilson all right, with all Brian right. Wilson present, which okay. you did not have in 1970 on Live in London. So that's one thing. And unlike what is on the Smile Sessions, which I believe is... Just the sing is it just the single version with some editing? Pretty much. Because it does have the longer ending. And it has the humbidums yeah. in it. Well, not edited. This has genuinely has the smile lyrics. Well, pet sounds lyrics really. Yeah. Are, they're from Tony, they're Tony Asher. Asher. That, okay, it was before fine. Smile started. Yeah, but yeah, but okay. It it's got the uh she's already working on my brain lyrics. And it's got the humbidas. And it's more smile than smile. And I put in my notes, though, I have to wonder if Brian would have had a longer Good Vibrations mix if he had finished Smile, if he, had, if he would have had a different version of Good Vibrations on the album. I would not be surprised. Since, man, since he wouldn't have been limited to, well, the version that was put out, I believe, is like three minutes and 30 seconds, which Ish, at that yeah. time was kind of long. Yeah, like and you, and you the, notice how it, was, it fades out really fast. Like, it was, da, 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 and that's it was it. kind of on the upper edge of what was acceptable yeah. for a radio single. So I imagine the album version, he may have gone and done a different edit that would have had the Humby Does and a longer editing ending and maybe even some additional stuff. I love how in the 2011 lineup, they did let the end go on for a little while. I love and that. I also, 2004, the way it ends, like, you know, the do 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 like it just to me, it's like someone getting to the top of a mountain. It's like the triumph that smile is finished. Mm. And of course, I can't hear 2004 without thinking of Jeff Foskett flipping his guitar over yep. where it said smile on the back yep. oh, and, man. and looking very happy and proud to be, have been a part of this whole thing. I still dearly love the 1966 single version. Oh, of I course. think yeah, well, that just is a stunning piece of pop music, especially since I've never heard anybody top the piano part in the middle you know, just oh god yeah that is i so mean that's cool. just it's just i love that so much but for the purpose of smile you've got to have a version with the humby does and with the tony asher verses yeah and by the way i going a little bit off track here i have to tell very common activity among beach boys fans is they talk about places where they hear something totally unexpected like say when we were in ocean grove once in in a, one of those shops they had a radio station playing, and we heard Judy, Judy, Judy. But like, what the <laughs> hell? But I think the winner of most obscure, unexpected Beach Boys things to be heard was when we saw the American Theater Company production of Hair in Chicago a few years ago. Those of you who aren't familiar with Hair, the second act of Hair begins with this. I think the scripted version says that one of the characters comes out with an old like Victrola and plays White Cliffs of Dover. And somebody else comes out on stage and kind of protests it and changes the state that you like turns on the radio or something. They kind of did that for this version. Act two starts, Chrissy comes out, then White Cliffs of Dover is playing. Somebody comes over, puts on the radio, and it's good vibrations. But it's the extended version with the humby dums <laughs> and the extended ending. I'm like, oh my God, somebody here has the smile sessions. <laughs> that was so just totally unexpected yeah but having said all that i i'm so sorry tony if you're listening no disrespect meant but i really hate the tony asher lyrics and i i'm i firmly believe they were meant to be placeholder lyrics i, I mean, really they, do they are a little clunky like, she's already working on my brain number one what does that mean number two the way they're sung it just doesn't kind yeah. of it doesn't fit they, the meter they are a little really. clunky and it's weird 
No, come on. But I still respect that they were. I still think that kind of helps set things separate. There's the smile version and then there's the single version. Well, that's one reason I'm also going with 2004 here because I don't like the Tony Asher lyrics and I don't like that that empty first line has, I love the colorful clothes she wears because going from that to she's already working in my brain. That's like saying, let's see, for dinner, I'm going to have a turkey sandwich. The B-side of Traveling Man is Hello, Mary Lou. So well, wait, where, well, what the hell do those well, two have to do with each other? Well, working on my brain, I mean, you could take, I take that as like, she's getting in my head. Like, I'm thinking about her but all the I time. I love the colorful clothes. Going from well, extremely specific to extremely broad. Also, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but if you listen to the original, she's the working on my brain version from 66. Which, by the way, is sung by Carl, not Brian. That is Carl okay, in a down. different voice. <laughs> that is not Brian, folks. Stop saying it's Brian. That goes for you, too, people who made the Love and Mercy movie. Yeah. Having said that, if you ever listen really carefully to that, the first line is missing. Yeah. If you listen really carefully, you can hear somebody singing something hmm. way off in the background. Yeah. For all I know, it could have been, I love the colorful clothes she wears. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, that would be really interesting to know what that line was. But still, as you said, for the purpose of smile, I'm going with 2004 easily. Again, because it's different. It has those different lyrics that set it aside. They're telling you, this is not what you're hearing on AM yeah. radio. This is not your dad's good vibrations. <laughs> yeah. And also, to be quite honest with me, the, it's, there's a little bit of unwanted distortion in what they used in 2011 that yeah. kind of threw me off. So I, di I didn't like that. But yeah, I love I love everything they used. I love that they threw in the humbidums and, um, of course, the extended ending. It's just perfect for for exactly the purpose of putting Smile together. And this is how they should have done it. And it's interesting when you kind of look back to all of the fan mixes and the endless debates that went on in the years, you know, kind of a, back in the dark ages of <laughs> the fan community when we really didn't have anything but bootlegs and bits and, and pieces yeah. of things like, say, the Good Vibrations box set, and yeah. things like that. We didn't have a lot of official stuff to go by. And so many of these mixes and, and list, track lists and all suppose that Smile would have ended with Surf's Up. But it kind of like, no, you don't want that because Surf's Up, I mean, is beautiful, but it's also very melancholy. I mean, when you have an album called Smile, I mean, it's kind of like how a Broadway musical you want people, for the most part, I know there's a few exceptions, like, say, for instance, hair. Yeah. But, like, for the most part, you want people leaving happy and humming a song from it. And you want you want an ending that's kind of uplifting and some kind of positive resolution. And I think ending with good vibrations, like, it sends you on your way with a smile. Yeah, absolutely. I, like, I can totally agree with that. you can't not listen to that song and not feel good seriously yeah it is not possible it is such a upbeat song that you can interpret in many ways mm -hmm. but that song is going to make you feel good that is why it was a number one hit that is why it endures all these years having said that though i do not blame anybody for putting together a smile lineup that's two sides and side two starts with good vibrations because I really think that's exactly what would have happened because that's what you do. You start the well, album then, sides with yeah. the singles. There would have been heroes and villains yep. on one side and good vibrations on the other. And that's exactly what happened with Smiley Smile. And I don't fault anybody who had a track list that would have ended the album with Surf's Up. I think back then, I mean, I nodded in agreement. Yeah. I thought that was perfectly logical. Like somebody else said before, it's because you wanted that a day in the life ending. Yeah, you wanted that kind that's of- That's kind of startling. Kind of like, yeah, like the performance at- uh, the Brian tribute at Radio City, where people people did not start applauding before the music ended like you yeah. usually have. People were stunned, stunned. And then there's a moment of silence before everybody just comes back to life and goes berserk. Yep. So it definitely is a logical choice. Oh, yeah. I just feel for the purpose, like when you're putting out an album where the cover is a big freaking sun <laughs> with all kinds of nice bright colors 
you want it to end on a high note. Yeah, and, absolutely. And again, the way they perform this, I feel, has a triumphant feel to it because this was such a triumph for Brian. Absolutely. I mean, just the fact that this music that he scrapped in 1967, it could have just sunk without a trace. Mm -hmm. It could have been that nobody ever talked about it. But the fact is, it was talked about mm -hmm. and that people cared. I mean, what's the dedication in- To the, the fans. It was dedicated to the fans. And I mean, we're not talking about a bunch of people who live in their parents' basement. I mean, we're talking about people all over the world. We're talking about people in the industry. Mm -hmm. There are people in the industry, probably half those people who voted for Mrs. O'Leary's cow had at least one smile bootleg on their shelf. I, I would not be surprised. <laughs> and who had been listening to this music for years and wanted to honor Brian for something so brilliant that they had enjoyed for such a long time. Mm. So it was the ideal way to end this work. And it is a work. It's most definitely a work. And of course, thinking back to 2004, February 20th, hopefully 20 years before the day uh, this, is all, this is on the, uh, the feed. <laughs> <laughs> Once they got to Good Vibrations, that's when probably everybody in that auditorium aside from, say, the ushers who might not have <laughs> no, known exactly what the importance was there, everybody in that auditorium could exhale because they know that from that point on, it was smooth sailing. Well, yeah, they were they were home free. And they I were just, in familiar, they were in safe harbor <laughs> at this point. And I just remember, I remember how we would watch Beautiful Dreamer and they'd show that performance of Mrs. O'Leary's Cow when Darian looks like he's about to oh. throw up. <laughs> And when we talked to Darian backstage on November 22nd, 2006 in New York City, and I, <laughs> I brought that up, I said, yeah, we, you know, no disrespect meant, but we love watching that and seeing you, you look like you're about to throw up. He said, well, that's how I felt through the whole show. It wasn't well, just yeah, that one part. Because... I hope by this time, Darian was like, okay, we made it through. I can breathe now. Yeah, I think he probably was because they had been performing good vibrations in concert. It wasn't anything to be afraid yeah. of. Brian wasn't going to freak out over it. Yeah. And I just love when they cut to Van Dyke Parks and he's just, he just lost his composure. Oh my God. He was sobbing because, well, that's the thing. This was probably something that he probably really believed in it. But with all that was going on in Brian's world where Van Dyke had to walk and, I, and he admitted in Beautiful Dreamer that. He really regretted walking away from Brian and probably yeah. other people of that time did as well. But you got to do what you, you got to have boundaries. Yeah. You yep. got to do what you got to do. And if it's just a point of being so frustrated or pissed off or feeling like this is not going well or that Brian is getting too much from different places or that he's not focused and for whatever reasons that people walked away from him. The fact that Van Dyke came back, I mean, just yeah. when he got that phone call from Brian, that yeah. was probably a call he had been hoping he would get for years. Yeah. And he probably f had always figured no matter what, if Brian called him up to talk about Smile, he would have been there. And it probably yeah. was a big help, again, going back to Melinda, that we're not talking about Brian calling Van Dyke in 1972 or 1976. Or in the 80s. We're talking about getting a call from Brian in 2003 when Brian was in a much better place. Yeah. Like a much better home life, a much better health situation mm -hmm. that he was supported, that he had already. I mean, Van Dyke had to have known that Brian had been touring. Oh, yeah. And he put together the uh, overture for the Pet Sounds Oh, that's, Sounds that's tour. right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, I mean, he had been associated with Brian. And he was at the so TNT tribute, knew, too. So, he knew that Brian was in a much better place. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Where a working relationship would be a much healthier situation than it would have been back in the 60s or 70s yeah. or 80s. Oh, and by the way, you talk about, say, when Van Dyke left. One of the Easter eggs that uh, that's been pointed out about Love and Mercy is when they're in the pool, and that's and when Van decides to up and leave. That that scene, 
each person on that screen represents how involved they wanted to be in the well, project. Yeah, because Brian was in the deep end. Yep. And, and Dennis was still pretty. He, he was. Dennis was in the water. I think Carl was kind of in the shallow end. Yeah. And Mike was nowhere near. Mike was out of the yeah. pool. <laughs> And I think Al, Al was kind of Al may have had his feet in the water, something like that. Yeah, and Van Dyke had his feet in the water too. And but that's then when he left. He, yeah. yeah, so, so it's, it's like interesting no, it's, portrayal there. Oh yeah, but, definitely. Um, I totally forgot what I was going to say, and that's the turkey alarm. So let's wrap this up. Okay. So yeah, having said that, yeah, I got more to say, but we, we can, can do that whenever we, we can want. Save that. We can. We save, didn't sign a contract. We can still talk about smile at another time. Yeah. So. Let's just call it an episode. So yeah. episode 22 yeah, go, next go, podcast. Go listen to Smile. Listen, yeah. Listen and go do your watch, own comparisons. And go watch Beautiful Dreamer. Go listen to yeah, Smile. Watch Beautiful Dreamer. Watch Love and Mercy. Listen to Smile. And uh, also listen to Tiki Aki yes. Orchestra, please. That's yes. A, a, one of, one of oh Nelson's many bands. I, oh I didn't God. know he was in that band until I got the re- their, their latest so record. Good. Oh, my God. They're so good. Anyway, um, anyway, I'm Sean. And I'm Lisa. We'll be back with episode 21 someday. Yes. Thank you for listening to the TuneX podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts or iTunes. You can hear us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon, Google Podcasts, and just about every other provider out there. If TuneX isn't on your favorite provider, please let us know. You can email us at tunexpodcast at gmail.com. Our website, which includes the show notes, is tunex.fab4it.com. Fab4it is spelled F-A-B and then the number four and then I-T. Feel free to connect with us on social media. Tunex is on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram and Twitter, both under the handle of Tunex Podcast. Our opening and closing theme, Melody 10, was written and performed by Scattered Frog. All other music and sounds used in this episode remain the properties of their respective copyright holders and are used for the purposes of commentary and review. No infringement is intended. We'll talk to you next time, friends. Until then, don't Don't back back down down from from that that wave. wave.